Hi everyone, I'm Alistair Horn, a freelance photographer based in Glasgow, Scotland and today with the Scots Magazine I'm going to be chatting all things photography. I've put together my favourite tips and tricks in this video to hopefully help you improve your photography skills going forward. Whether you're a keen amateur or someone who's just picked up their new camera and wants to hone their skills. 2020 has been a crazy year to say the least and we're currently in our second lockdown here in Scotland but one of the main positives that I've taken from this whole situation has been getting to understand and know the local area, finding new walks and paths I've never explored in my life, and really discovering the, you know, the natural world in more detail right outside from my doorstep. There's a new path I've found uh, with rabbits that are exploring all the time, and there's cow and cows in my local park, and it's been really nice to kind of see stuff locally and not have to travel further afield to see these spots. My tips and tricks video I'm about to share is useful for any sort of situation, whether that's your local park or further afield and we're able to travel once more and see more views. Hopefully they'll deepen your knowledge of photography and help you encourage you even more in your photographic journey going forward. One of my main rules when shooting photography is that light is your subject. From a sunny winter's morning to a dreary Scottish day, which is currently happening right now here, being able to interpret the weather and how this will impact your final picture is really, really important. The shadows from the sun or the cloud cover, they're always changing and evolving and knowing the weather forecast and what's going to happen in the near future is really important in getting you prepared for taking that picture. Even on cloudy days, seeing a well-trodden path in different light conditions can make you appreciate something that you otherwise might not have spotted. A personal example of making the most of differing light is this shot taken from a hike beside Loch Lomond from earlier this year. Having checked the forecast in advance, I knew that in the morning there was a slight chance of the sun popping through the cloud cover. I gambled with an early morning start and found a vantage point that I thought could be promising. Luckily for me, the weather was as expected, making for a slightly more dramatic photo of the loch with the added light. Quite a lot of the time, the forecast is either wrong or the conditions don't happen as you hope, but on odd occasion like this, everything does go as planned. Uh, here's another example of making the most of the differing light. It's a photo of my dog, Simon. And yes, this may not be the most fantastic picture in the world, I know, but it proves a point about the light. Seeing that the sun was about to come out, I grabbed my camera and made the most of the different shades of light coming through the trees, making for a nicer photo under the circumstances. The patches of green light added an extra layer to the photo, and Simon wasn't too bothered about me taking a few pictures. Aside from checking the forecast and making the most of what Mother Nature offers you, composition is another factor that is key in photography. Being able to compose and frame your photo how you want is a great way to differentiate your style and really take your skills to the next level. One kind of factor of composition is leading lines. They're a fantastic tool and useful to guide your, the viewer's eyes from one part of a photo in a specific direction. For example, a road, a river, a fence, the natural slope of a field, they all give a viewer a trail from which to follow the photo. You personally as a photographer can interpret this however you want and this leads to lots of unique work and pictures created as a result of leading lines. Another picture which is a good example of leading lines is this shot I took in Glencoe a few years ago of one of the main famous white houses. The path that I was on is, is a good leading line up towards that main house and then you have the path on the mountain heading you back up towards the slope and then that leads you up towards the top of the mountain. The same photo of the light beams in Loch Lomond also is a good example of leading lines. The sloping ferns at the bottom of the photo lead you from their highest point on the left, sloping down to the right hand side, as do the treetops just behind them. In this shot of Highland Cows taken at my local park this year, I framed it so there was a flow to the picture when you view the cows in a curved line, drawing your attention from the bottom to the top right of the photo. Shooting quirky photos in my opinion can be really interesting and fun, uh, so experiment, see what you can come up with. A lot of people always go on about the rule of thirds and that's very important for a lot of pictures but on the odd occasion, it's nice to try something a little different. Sometimes you need to remind yourself to create these patterns and stories in a shot, but sometimes it just occurs unconsciously and you, you just happen to do it. Being able to understand and compose a photo with leading lines is a great way to convey a message or a story behind your photo in a subtle manner. Leading lines can be a really effective way of moving the viewer's eyes from one point of the photo to the other, but it's not the only effective method to encourage certain behaviour in regards to composition. If you want to focus on a specific part of the photo, being able to compose that shot so that it stands out can be quite tricky, but really, really effective. Some really easy examples of how to make your subject the focus point of your picture. You can, can either create depth of field in which the subject is totally in focus and the rest of the background is blurry. 
you can create an active space, meaning that it's very obvious which part of the picture you want people to focus on. Or you can create contrast with colour, meaning that again the subject will kind of stand out and the gaze of the viewer will go towards that part of the picture. This photo was taken from the same hike beside Loch Lomond and it's a good example of having a focal point in your picture. I found this white house in the middle of the hike against a backdrop of green. Taking this photo, it's, it's quite easy to make the fo house you know, a focal point, with there being quite a lot of negative space and the colour contrast of the house and the countryside. It easily stands out and makes you appreciate how quiet and remote this house probably is to live in. This might have been more tricky to understand had I only pictured the house a lot closer in rather than with the landscape surrounding it. If you're out on a walk and come across a beautiful view that you want to photograph, it might be hard for people to comprehend the scale of a certain view. So having another object in the photo for perspective is a great way of doing this. This could be an animal, a person or a car from far away. And this can really help the viewer understand the landscape in more detail and just how vast it really is in comparison to our size. This picture was taken three years ago on Sky on one of my favourite hikes overlooking the Coolins and Loch Karusk with my friend George. It's not necessary to have him there but I really liked him in the photo for the perspective of just seeing how vast this area is and how small we are in comparison. One tip which may go against your kind of common sense is to embrace the conditions even if they are pretty rough. Scotland's weather is really unpredictable. We've had snow the last two days and I'm sure it will have disappeared uh, by tomorrow. Uh, for me that's one of its plus points. Having you know this random weather which never kind of stays the same even for five minutes means that Mother Nature throws up different scenes in front of you in the same spot over and over and over again. Knowing that the sideways rain or the gale force winds will probably disappear within a few hours or a few days you really just need to make the most of it and hopefully be in the right place at the right time where the light will just be perfect for what you're hoping and expecting. Hopefully with the right clothing, a positive attitude and your fingers crossed, being in the right place should pay off in the long run even if that means you have to try multiple times in the same spot. Hopefully Mother Nature will paint a picture for you that you want to photograph. This is my example of kind of embracing the conditions and those few sites and compositions that randomly appear before you. This is also taken on the same hike around Loch Lomond this year. The rolling hills and the treetops, as by themselves, are not the greatest photo, but the whirling vortex clouds that appeared above them when I came across the view completely changed the photo. Had it not been for the windy conditions, this shot probably would never have come to fruition. For the sake of waiting 5-10 to 10 minutes to see if the weather improves, it's always worth taking the chance. A little tip in relation to your camera setup. To manipulate the colour balance of the photo before you started editing, in real time have a look at your white balance. This can totally change the colour and makeup of a scene before a photo has even been taken. Just like when you go skiing and put on a new pair of ski goggles, the white snow changes to yellow or blue in relation to the colour tone of your actual ski goggles. The white balance works in a similar way, it completely changes the colour palette of a photo. Have a try around with different light conditions and the different settings and see if you can find a, a colour that suits the style of photo you want to take. It's a great way to cut down on the editing beforehand as well. Following on from the white balance, probably the most important tip is to get to know your camera and the settings. You know, how, understanding how your camera actually works and what you need to change in order for it to manipulate the shot you're on is really, really important. The automatic setting on a camera is a no-no. You need to get to know how your aperture, your ISO and your shutter speed actually work. The aperture refers to the size of the opening in the lens diaphragm. Basically, a small f-stop like f3 means a larger opening in the lens leading to a larger depth of field, meaning one specific focus point. This results in this photo of the horse being in focus and the rest of the photo being completely blurry. Whereas a larger number like F18 means a smaller opening, meaning less light reaches the camera but more of the picture is sharp and in focus. Take this picture uh, from Orkney in the Hoy coastline. Being a larger f-stop like F11 or F12, the whole landscape is in focus as well as the coastline. So having a higher f-stop is perfect for a landscape photo. The ISO indicates how sensitive the sensor is to light on your camera. For example, when you want to capture the Milky Way or the Aurora Borealis, you'll need to increase the camera's ISO to let in more light between 1000 and 2000 ISO. This photo I took in the Cairngorms was of the Milky Way. Obviously in the night sky was a lot darker, so the ISO was up around 1500 ISO. Unfortunately though, higher settings bring more grain to a photo, so you don't want to push it too high. For your bog standard image, during the day, an ISO of 100 to 200 is perfect. The shutter speed is the amount of time your camera's shutter stays open, again influencing how much light makes it into the sensor of the camera. Faster shutter speeds can stop motion and freeze frame a moving animal or a sports star. 
like this photo I took in Rwanda last year. We had some local men doing some traditional dancing and I was able to capture them as they were jumping up and down, really enjoying the moment. Whereas a long shutter speed, like three or four seconds, will let in a lot more light, will give you the option of capturing blur and motion, like moving cars on a highway leaving trails, or water falling from a waterfall. Like this example in Iceland that I took uh, near Kirkjufell in 2015. The long shutter speed gave a slightly different impression of the water and it gave a really cool blur and motion to the water. One great trick that I've used a lot, especially for landscape work, is horizontal panning. If you come across a specific viewpoint and you can't fit the whole thing into your lens, then this is a great option. Make sure that when you're taking the first picture, that you half click on the shutter button so that everything that you want in the picture is in focus. Once you've done that and you know that it's in focus, change the settings on your lens from automatic to manual. This means that every single picture you then take is already in focus and you won't have to change this every time you take a picture. Once you've done this, you can start clicking away. You want to try and get the horizon in the same point of each picture, obviously, so that it's straight when you take the photo. You can do as many as you want. You can do two, three, four. I usually do about four in total and take one picture, one there, one there, and one there. And then in post-production, you can add them together. Try and get a little overlap between the two every single picture. So this means that you can put it together in post-production. It's a really effective way of making a panorama from a view that you could, you could never fit with one photo. The harbour at Plockton in the northwest coast of Scotland. It's one of my favourite places in Scotland to kind of just relax and enjoy the, the coastal scenes. This was taken uh, earlier this year um, as a combined four stitch picture uh, into panorama. Of course, I could never be able to fit all of this into my camera straight away, so combining the four photos and putting it into one picture kind of really helps kind of show the whole landscape that was in front of me to see. There's no maximum amount of pictures you can combine to create a panorama, but it does get a lot trickier the more pictures you combine, as the horizon may be slightly off in different pictures, making it impossible to create a panorama. So I would recommend a few, three, four, five, or six, to start with to see how you go on. Shoot what you love. It's a really obvious phrase, but if you have a passion about a certain subject, whether it's wildlife, landscapes, portraits, the urban environment, try and really focus on that and improve your skills in that certain subject. It'll make it much more enjoyable for yourself. At the end of the day, yes, you like to hear people appreciate your work, but the main reason you do these pictures is for your own enjoyment and to look back on those memories fondly. And if you focus on something that you really enjoy, then you're going to be really happy as a result. If you want to emphasise vastness of a location, try and zoom out and take in as much of it as you can. Give the subject matter some space. This photo taken last year in Rwanda, we were driving all the way back to Kigali, the capital, uh, from the Volcanoes National Park, which we were looking back on here. I wanted to kind of emphasise the green, green country and the vast, open, wide landscapes that Rwanda has in, its, in magnitude. Uh, and thankfully there were some really nice leading lines and some nice light coming through, which made for this photo. If you're focusing on a specific thing, maybe a person, fill the frame and really try and capture the details in that person. I took this photo of my friend Consta on a trip in Lapland two years ago and I really wanted to capture all the frozen icicles on his moustache and, and his eyebrows and just how cold that walk was. The ability to adapt depending on the subject matter you're shooting is really, really important. Try and be as flexible as, as possible depending on what sort of approach you want to take. I hope my monotonous Scottish voice has not put you to sleep in the last 15 minutes and these tips and tricks have come in useful in some sort of way in regards to your photography going forward. As you can see, there's a multitude of things going on whilst taking photos. It's not just as easy as clicking the shutter. Have a go with one or two of them the next time you're out on a walk or next time you're up a mountain and see if they help you in any way improve your kind of photography going forward. Thanks very much for following along. I hope you've enjoyed the video. I'm Ali.Horn on Instagram or Ali Horn Photography on Facebook. If you want to give me any more questions and reach out, then feel free to say hello.